Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Research America Alliance member, uh, member web meeting. As always, we thank you for your terrific partnership and participation in the Alliance. We have, got, we have a great crowd of over 200 today. Um, all audience members are on mute. You can type your questions into the Q&A box at any time. And my colleague, Terry Schwartzbeck and I will ask as many as possible. Um, our guest does have a hard stop at 2 p.m. And while we won't perhaps get to all the questions, his staff has asked us to share those we don't get to so that they can work those into their future outreach. Well, I have no doubt today's guest has clocked many 18 hour days leading up to Friday's announcement that the FDA authorized use of the very first COVID-19 vaccine. And while he has many more long days ahead of him, including today, we're grateful that Dr. Peter Marks, the, the director of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at the FDA is with us today. Peter, thank you so much for including the Research America Alliance in your important outreach about the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. So uh, I really appreciate your tuning in today. There are so many meetings to tune into and it's very nice of you to spend a little time with this. Um, I'm gonna spend about five minutes telling you a little bit about uh, the uh, Pfizer BioNTech authorization uh, and some of the more commonly asked questions. And then I think it's just best to have a a Q&A period because that'll get to what's most on people's mind. Uh, so um, uh, uh, it is true, uh, last Friday uh, the 11th, we authorized the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, uh, mRNA vaccine uh, against COVID-19. Uh, this came after really a tremendous effort on the part of uh, my colleagues at FDA in the Office of Vaccines, Office of Biostatistics and Epidemiology, and in our Office of Biologics uh, Compliance and Quality, um, and other components of our center, as well as other components of FDA to do uh, a tremendous amount of work over the course of several weeks, um, uh, intensely reviewing the emergency use authorization request. That was done after we had done several months of work setting things up uh, so that we would be able to do such a rapid uh, review. Um, we're confident that the, uh, that the emergency use authorization represents uh, a, a really a milestone because we're, we're confident that the output of this uh, is a highly effective uh, vaccine against COVID-19 uh, that's also very safe. Um, obviously, when uh, the, the trial that was done for this is very similar in size uh, to the types of trials that would be done uh, for any other uh, licensed vaccine, um, uh, although the safety follow-up is somewhat shorter. And so uh, what we uh, don't have in terms of the duration of safety follow-up, we're going to make up for uh, with a combination of safety surveillance from uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and FDA working together uh, to provide us uh, with that uh, uh, additional information. Um, but this emergency use authorization um, is somewhere above the floor of what an emergency use authorization must be. So the floor is it, the product may be effective and the known and potential benefits have to outweigh the known and potential risks. This is closer to uh, like a, a, a fixture hanging off the ceiling uh, because uh, it's uh, closer to something that has substantial evidence of effectiveness. And that's because the, the trial that's been done uh, has provided clear and compelling evidence um, of effectiveness. So um, we're very comfortable uh, seeing this vaccine deployed. Obviously, we're going to take do and do del due diligence to make sure we continue to look um, at safety issues that might emerge. And we're obviously going to try to look at some of the key unknowns that we still have with this vaccines. So we still don't know the duration of protection. We'll get that from uh, individuals who are being followed for as long as two years on the clinical trial and they're going to be tested. So we'll understand how long people are protected. The second question is, does this vaccine interrupt asymptomatic transmission? Uh, and that's something that we will probably get sometime uh, by early summer uh, because of trials that are going to be uh, initiated through the National Institutes of Health where they're gonna look uh, in a good population for looking at asymptomatic transmission, uh, probably college students on various college campuses to see if the vaccine can prevent uh, asymptomatic transmission. 
And then we'll know from global surveillance uh, whether uh, this uh, particular virus is able to emerge with variants that can escape uh, the ability of the vaccine to create an immune response that uh, uh, prevents disease. So those are the three kind of top of mind questions that we'll still have to answer. So far from being a done deal, we still have a lot of work to do on this vaccine, but this is an incredibly important first step with getting us uh, towards uh, a place where we might get back to more normal lives. Um, I think some of the common questions we've had uh, that have come up, uh, probably I'll tell you what they are so you have a menu of what I'm gonna cover. Um, one has to do with one or two doses. Another has to do with uh, the allergic reactions and the uh, other has to do with what about um, uh, various populations uh, that haven't been studied yet or that haven't been reported. So um, the one versus two dose question, um, I, 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 I'm I gonna try, uh, my chief of staff, Julie Tierney, tells me I have to calm down about this. So I'm gonna take a deep breath. That feels good. Um, really, um, we spent tremendous amount of time, the company spent tremendous amount of time carefully evaluating a regimen uh, based on good preclinical science, that is animal studies uh, and early studies in humans um, to come up with this two dose regimen in the case of the Pfizer vaccine, dose one on day one and dose two on day 22. Um, uh, and that brought this uh, level of protection of about 95% effectiveness in preventing COVID-19. So some people see the fact that it does seem like there was some effectiveness after the first dose was given, but what they don't really understand is that we only really know that effectiveness because people in the trial got, they all pretty much all got two doses of the vaccine. So um, really we can estimate that if you didn't get uh, a second dose, maybe is it 50% uh, effective? We don't know for sure. And we don't know how long it would be effective for. We don't know whether you would get an immune response that would just dwindle. And we know that can happen uh, because we know already that people who get very mild COVID-19 tend to lose their immune responses pretty quickly. So um, I, I'm hoping that we're able to have people um, uh, understand that really uh, before we start uh, going off and doing things differently than the way they're supposed to be done, we probably should follow uh, the two dose regimen. I know it's very tempting to want to vaccinate more people and somehow spread the wealth, but sometimes you have to do the job right uh, and rather than uh, uh, rather than just uh, spread the wealth around. And I think we need to make sure that those who get the vaccine regimen are people who know they've gotten that protection because that's something we know whereas the other is conjecture. And I would hate for people to change their behavior on the basis of one dose of vaccine where we don't know what's really happening. Whereas not that I, I think that anyone should stop mask wearing uh, or social distancing, even if they get the two dose regimen yet. But the difference there is when you have 95% effectiveness, that is uh, uh, a, very different, uh, a very different area. So there's that issue. Um, so that's the, the two dose regimen issue. There's the allergic reactions that occurred in the United Kingdom. Now in the 22,000 people in the United States trials uh, who received the vaccine, comparing them to the 22,000 who received placebo, there was a very slight imbalance in the uh, number of allergic types of reactions uh, and that wasn't st significant. Um, uh, this type of anaphylaxis uh, or, or a severe allergic reaction um, is something that we don't yet know what to make of for sure. Um, I think as a precaution, we're telling uh, people that if you've had a severe allergic reaction to a vaccine or to one of the vaccine components, and probably the most common components that someone might have an allergic reaction to in this vaccine might be uh, polyethylene glycol, um, uh, uh, which is uh, one of the things uh, that is, uh, uh, is in a number of different kinds, kinds of uh, uh, drug products. Um, and then um, we're, we're, we're not going to say that if you've ever had a severe allergic reaction, you shouldn't get the, uh, the vaccine because that would exclude uh, about one and a half percent or more of the American population. That's probably not a smart thing to do. Um, and 
So instead, as a precaution, we're telling all sites that administer the vaccine that they need to be ready to treat an allergic reaction. And we'll get a lot more data in the not too distant future uh, as this campaign runs through uh, and we'll keep the public informed about what we see for allergic reactions. I'm sure as we see this vaccine deployed into hundreds of thousands and then millions of people, there may be some changes that we'll have to inform uh, the public about, but we're pretty certain of its overall safety as we deploy it based on the data we have or else we wouldn't let it uh, have received the emergency use authorization. Um, and then, uh, so, so we hit those two things. And then we have the other issue of people will ask about what about pregnant women, children, um, those who are immunocompromised. Um, well, for the immunocompromised, I think that's right now, it's left to a decision with a provider uh, about, uh, uh, about the value of, uh, of vaccination. Um, we don't believe it will be harmful. It's just they may not make as robust an immune response. And I'm sure we'll get more data on that um, as there are studies done. Uh, in terms of pregnant women, uh, there were not enough pregnant women in the trial to really know uh, what uh, the safety profile is. However, we think that on first principles, uh, it's not something that has to be contraindicated in pregnant women. And so there again, it's gonna be a discussion of uh, an individual uh, and her provider uh, around whether or not to get vaccinated because COVID-19 during pregnancy is not a good thing. Um, and then for pediatrics, uh, we'll uh, expect that over the next few months, we'll see a set of studies done in which there's age de-escalation. Age de uh, and so we'll, we've seen that the, uh, this current authorization is for 16 years and up. Uh, there's a small amount of data uh, in those 12 to uh, 15 years of age, we'll see that data set expanded. Once there's comfort that uh, there's sufficient safety in that population, there will be age de escalation down to a younger uh, pre-adolescent uh, population and then uh, to uh, younger children. Um, one has to be a little careful here with children because we do know that COVID-19 does have some different things that present in children like this inflammatory syndrome. And we wanna make sure that when we vaccinate them, we don't create problems. So those studies will go on. The good news with children is we can benefit from what we've learned now with adults and we won't have to do uh, clinical endpoint studies looking at them to get sick. We'll have to look at just whether they develop the kind of immune responses that we now see associated uh, with uh, protection against COVID-19. Um, so that should somewhat speed up those trials in children. Um, so I, those are kind of the key, uh, most common questions. And I'll stop now and, uh, and open it up for uh, questions and answers that you might have. Thanks. Well, Peter, clearly you've done this uh, more than once because you did answer many of the questions that uh, people had raised, but not all of them. So um, you spoke about um, the additional work that has to be done in terms of the pediatric population, but on the upper age limit in the Pfizer trial, um, what do we expect the immune response to be in the frail elderly? So uh, th that's a really uh, a really good a, a good question. We know what it's like in the elderly who are able to participate in a clinical trial. And it was very encouraging that it seems like the immune response was very similar in people in their 80s as it was uh, in younger individuals. And that's really great. Um, and that actually is a credit to the company because when they were developing this, they deliberately uh, made sure um, that uh, older individuals seemed to have a robust uh, immune response before they proceeded. So it's actually a good example of how even when moving very rapidly um, uh, it, through development, people can actually take the time to go carefully enough um, that they made sure that was the case. Now, the frail elderly, could this be different? It's possible, um, uh, but the hope would be that if the, there is a difference, it's modest. And we're gonna get a, we're gonna get a sense of that from real world evidence. Um, we will be monitoring uh, nursing home facilities, and we'll get an, an evidence of effectiveness in that population, as well as safety in that population. Um, uh, interestingly, with this vaccine, the, some of the side effects that people uh, complain of 
uh, they're actually fewer in the older population than in the younger population. Um, that may just be, you know, it, 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 it's hard to know exactly why uh, that's the case. Um, uh, it may be because as we get older, I'm kind of used to being tired all the time. So if I got a vaccine and I was tired, I'd probably just chalk it up to uh, another day of being tired. Um, but um, we'll just have to see. It's a great question, um, but I think we're very lucky to see the, I mean, I think it's a great start to see, you know, the kind of immune responses in healthy 75-year-olds that we're seeing in healthy 85-year-olds, and hopefully that will uh, transfer over uh, to the, the frailer uh, set of people in that age range. Terrific. I think Terry is going to post the, um, post the next question. Yes, we have a whole bunch. Thank you so much. And first of all, I have to add that many folks are just writing in saying thank you, and they're so uh, proud of the FDA right now. Um, what systems in place are uh, there to monitor safety once a vaccine or once a patient is uh, receiving this vaccine? You mentioned something about a combination between the CDC and the FDA. Can you talk a little bit about how that's going to work and how the public can report any side effects? Right. So there's there's essentially uh, an overlapping series of safety measures. So one of the safety measures is done by CDC and FDA working together. That's the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Public can get access to that through MedWatch forms right online. Um, providers have access to that. That's traditional safety reporting of adverse events, also known as passive safety reporting. To that, CDC has added a something that people can opt into, which is when they get vaccinated, they'll be able to ask uh, to get an app for their, it's, it's basically a, a, a text messaging that they'll get uh, daily after they've gotten the vaccine for seven days, and then uh, they'll get it weekly for six weeks, and then uh, every few months, asking them whether they've had adverse events. And if certain adverse events are present, such as, well, I've lost a day of work because I think it was related to the vaccine, they'll get a call uh, from someone at CDC to follow up on that. That's called the VSAFE system that, that they've set up just for COVID-19, and that should provide some insight there. They also at, at CDC, uh, particularly in the younger age population, can use uh, their vaccine safety data link um, uh, and uh, the immunization uh, study uh, patients that they have. On the other hand, from the FDA perspective, we have the large database systems that have been set up over the past decade, Sentinel and variations on Sentinel. Our variation in the Center for Biologics is a system that connects the claims-based databases on, that have hundreds of millions of lives in them to the electronic health record on tens of millions of lives so that if we see one of about 20 different safety signals that we think might happen, that we're concerned could happen with uh, vaccination, um, that we're able to hone down on the signal very quickly. So I think that's going on uh, for those getting the vaccine outside of clinical trials. The companies will also be doing pharmacovigilance and they'll also be continuing to follow individuals on the clinical trials as they go forward in the next two years. Terrific, thanks, Peter. Um, another question from the audience. How should members of the rare disease community evaluate the risk benefit of the COVID-19 vaccination as it relates to them? Yeah, I think this is one where they should have a conversation with their provider. Um, it, it, by, by and large, um, these are th this first series of vaccines coming out, these are not live virus vaccines. So um, they should not be a, an issue in general if, for, if, as a problem for someone who's immune compromised whether they'll have the same level of efficacy. Again, that is something we're gonna to have to determine, but I think this is a perfect conversation to have with a provider because particularly if somebody already has a respiratory, just something that has uh, a, a, some, uh, uh, causes them to have some respiratory abnormality, the benefits may outweigh the risks and that's best discussed with one's own provider. Um, I saw a question pop up that I should have mentioned. And this is one I, I have to slap myself for not answering. There's a, a quick, uh, a, 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 one of the questions that a lot of people have is what if you've already had COVID-19, uh, should you get vaccinated? And um, what we know from the clinical trial is that there did not appear to be any adverse event uh, associated with having had COVID-19 before and then getting vaccinated. 
what happened in the clinical trial is people were enrolled, their status was determined, but the randomization did not occur based on that status. So we can look back and see where there are adverse events and there's no imbalance in the adverse events. That said, CDC right now is suggesting that if you had COVID-19, probably wait about three months before getting vaccinated uh, because that's probably when your immunity is starting to wane um, and that's when it would make most sense to do so. So probably no harm in getting vaccinated, but the CDC, especially when we're in this situation of having uh, a, a reduced uh, capacity for vaccinating people, um, if you've had COVID-19, probably can wait a couple months before getting vaccinated. Again, that's just a recommendation from CDC. That's not in our FDA uh, recommendation. All right. Um, so here's one around data um, and public availability of data. Um, J&J has committed to releasing all data, including participant level clinical trial data. Um, will the FDA make this a requirement for other manufacturers as part of the EUA process? Yeah, so um, we, we, if you get on our website now, you'll see that there is a tremendous amount of data in terms of summary data that's been released by Pfizer for their uh, that they put forward in their briefing book, and then we put uh, in, in our in our briefing book. It's very challenging to make available patient level data because one wants to make sure it's truly de-identified. People who participate in clinical trials should not have to worry that somebody is going to come up to them and say, "Oh, weren't you the one from uh, Peoria uh, that actually was vaccinated and part of this trial?" Because there's, it turns out that this has been studied. And it's very easy sometimes to triangulate back to identify participants. So usually when, when those types of data are made available, they're made available oftentimes closed to investigators. And there are a variety of different ways uh, to do that. I, I think we will be, ha and I think we certainly encourage it uh, as long as the patient confidentiality is uh, protected, but we can't, we can't require it. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that Data transparency is great, um, but also patient confidentiality has to be assured when that's uh, when that's done. Uh, Peter, um, I'm going to put two questions together. Um, I write for the Hispanic community in the U.S. What particular message can help you get our fellow Americans on board? They get most yeah. of their news from social media. And then a similar question regarding the African-American community. Yeah. How do we reach out to um, these minority communities? So I, I think we need to reach out by making sure we get to their providers, to get to the people that they trust in their communities. We are lucky enough to have worked with Reagan Udall Foundation and they provided us with some very good insight. They trust, it turns out I was shocked, they actually trust the FDA somewhat. Um, uh, uh, which is really wonderful. Um, they trust their providers a lot. Um, we need to get out the word to their providers, uh, to their community leaders, um, that this is a safe vaccine, that this is not something uh, that we would allow uh, out there if we weren't willing to have our own family members take it. Um, and uh, I think that's why, you know, I, I have to say it is wonderful uh, that there is, uh, uh, an African-American nurse on the front page. If you, if you go to the New York Times website right now, look who's front and center as the first person vaccinated um, uh, in uh, New York State, uh, an intensive care unit nurse, uh, fantastic. That's gonna help bring people along. And we really need people brought along because unfortunately COVID-19 has, has it, it, it's fed into all of the other things that have gone on this year. And I'm not gonna go into those other things because I think everyone's been awake probably uh, to notice them. And we need to come past that and to come together. Uh, and then this is essentially, when you think right now, something that's very sobering, um, that we've lost more lives now to this virus than we lost in World War II, um, we need to come together against this common enemy of the virus. And it doesn't matter who you are on what side of what, uh, we need to work together here um, and getting vaccinated is going to be 
what's going to get us there. So that's really important. I'm going to sneak an extra bonus in here. I saw one. Uh, it's people who are, who are worried about getting gene therapies in the future for the rare disease community are worried about this, uh, this particular uh, Pfizer vaccines. It's an mRNA vaccine. It doesn't have a viral vector associated with it. It shouldn't be a problem if somebody's considering gene therapy in the future. It just, this is one of those things that you uh, will go away. So I, don't worry about that. If you're considering an AAV uh, gene therapy in the future, um, it's okay to get vaccinated. Terry? Yes, we have a couple more if we have, can squeeze them in. First of all, there's a lot of questions about immunity. Do we, what do we know um, at this point about the duration of immunity from actually having COVID versus the duration of immunity from the vaccine? Do we know how long-term that protection is gonna be? Well, we know, the, we know that the duration of protection uh, from having COVID-19 uh, seems to be variable and it probably has to do, uh, we speculate, on quite how severe you might have it. The more severe you a case you have, the longer it seems a uh, duration of immunity you might have. Um, but we don't know that for sure. Um, and um, as, as for the vaccine, we know that the duration of immunity lasts at least months because we know that people who were vaccinated uh, back in July, the end of July, um, uh, uh, we know that they uh, seem to be immune uh, uh, still. Uh, but we don't know on a population basis how long on average people uh, will remain immune to this. Now, some would say, oh my goodness, but you don't know and I'm getting this vaccine. Well, I think we can say this. We know that the duration of immunity is probably at least, probably gonna be four to six months. And right now in the middle of this pandemic with about 3000 people a day dying of this, anything that we can do to interrupt this is a really good thing. And one of the uh, kind of footnotes to these mRNA vaccines that's actually very positive is that unlike some of the virally vectored vaccines, one can boost with these repeatedly. So if it turns out that a year from now we need to get boosters, it, it, will be, oh, it, it wouldn't be the end of the world. I mean, it would be nicer if we didn't have to, but listen, at this point, we got to do something to transition out of this terrible spot that we're in. Peter, um, I think this might be our last question. Um, will we continue to monitor those who have been vaccinated to help us understand the immune response? Yeah, the companies are, are planning on following individuals uh, for two years. And, and my guess is that actually that'll be a, a nice group of people because they'll have some who they will have followed for the full two years and others, that, so that'll be the 22,000 who are vaccinated up front. And then they're gonna have a group that they'll probably follow an additional 22,000, for instance, the case of, of Pfizer, um, who probably will be followed uh, for something like 18 or so months after they're vaccinated, because many of those people will get the vaccine now as, as part, as they cross over um, uh, at an appropriate time. Uh, Pfizer has, has said that, that people who, even if they decide not to get the vaccine immediately uh, after uh, after this establishment of, of, of effectiveness and, and the EUA, that if they stay on the placebo arm, they'll still get vaccinated at six months. So there'll be actually this reasonably uh, robust data set of duration of protection, uh, very rigorous adverse event capture, um, and immunologic monitoring, and that's going to be helpful. Well, Peter, I think we should let you go um, for the sake of the country. Uh, thank you again for joining us um, and for your leadership at Seabird. Your dedication and that of your colleagues exemplifies the very best of public service to our nation. So we are all very indebted to you. Well, thank you so much. But I owe, I owe an incredible debt of gratitude um, to colleagues who were really doing most of the hard work, which is uh, spending lots of hours poring over lots of pages um, uh, people making site visits when necessary and, and, and really doing a, a heroic effort uh, towards getting through a tremendous amount of material in a very short amount of time. So I will thank them on your behalf too. Thank we'll be you. sharing, we, we have a fact sheet and we'll be sharing the FDA information on our site as well. Thanks very much. All right, take, take care. care. Bye -bye. Quick thank announcement um, to those on the call. Um, please join us for our next meeting which is on Wednesday, this Wednesday, 
at 1.30, and we're going to have a really great fireside chat with social change innovator uh, Bill Novelli and nationally known journalist and media expert Frank Sesno. Bill is the founder of the Business Impact Program at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. He's also the former CEO of AARP and the founder and chair of Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. Bill and Frank will discuss Bill's new book, Good Business, The Talk, Fight, Win Way to Change the World, and strategies that scientists, researchers, and advocates like us can use to overcome seemingly insurmountable obstacles to achieve major policy advocacy and business objectives. Uh, I believe we have also posted um, a fact sheet that our team did on the, uh, the COVID-19 EUA process, um, and we'll also have that on our website. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday.